to me, yes man pastor, hit it, and stand with played, and played, and played, and when I want to finish, he would keep on playing again, and again, we had some great times, he was a godly Christian young man, a good mentor, a good role model, he was committed, dedicated, never said no. Fortunately, I was transferred to St. Lucia to work. I was in North, but when I landed in the North and I settled down, I contacted Stan. And lo and behold, of a very first crusade and first concert, Stan was there. To the extent that all of my camps, or most of the camps I conducted in St. Lucia took place at Campus B. And the community center, not far from where you are, Stan was my musician. I believed in him, I trusted him. He knew exactly what note and what key to touch. He was in my crusades, repeatedly. When I heard of his passing, my soul sunk within. Condolences to you, the entire To his dear precious wife, Ketura. To his sons, Kelton, Vance, Koshan, and Vinklan. To his mom and dad, Marcella, and Henry, Philbert. To Linz, Trevor, Mervyn, Claudius, his sister Sandra, Eustatius, Hydrina, Hydrania. Listen. I know what you're going through. I feel your pain. I lost my dad just last year, April, buried him on the 18th of April to be exact. It was a sad moment and still is a sad moment, but I am always comforted with John 14, one to three. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. I held on to Psalm 121. I would lift up my eyes onto the hills from whence cometh my help. I always reminded myself constantly, Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and, and lean not to your own understanding. In all the ways acknowledge him. I believe with all my heart, just as stand, they believe that it is in Revelation 20 and 21, uh, the last few chapters in that beautiful book, that Jesus will come again. We always wanted and talked about going home to live in heaven for a thousand years. To walk on the streets that look like gold and stand in the sea that looks like glass and to walk under that tree in the center of that city that has leaves for the healing of all nations. Oh my God. And then we vision in our minds what it would be like when this place is refurbished, this earth that we're living in right now. Where there where, where, where we have so much problems and troubles. We it will be refurbished and we will resume when it is cleansed by fire. And we're gonna live here on this earth when we return after the thousand years. Stan always talk about that. He said there'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no more hardship, no more stress, no more separation, no more problems, no more crime and violence. We Debt will be swallowed up in victory and there'll be no more sin. And we will live for eternity. And eternity is a long, long, long time. So again, to you, all who are celebrating his homegoing service at this moment, pay no last respect to a great young man. To you, 
his wife Keturah and his sons, his siblings and parents. Hold on to the unchanging hands of Almighty God, for it won't be long. Any time now, Jesus will come. I can hear the drum beats on the horizon. I can see and feel the signs are telling and foretelling that his coming is imminent. It is near, nearer than we first believe. So I encourage you, as Stan would have done and has always done, get ready, be prepared, stay ready, and let's keep looking up. For he who said he will come is coming and will come soon and very soon. So until then, in spite of our mourning, our weeping, our sadness, broken hearts, I said to you, have faith in God and may Stan Stanilos Philbert, soul, rest in peace. God bless you in Jesus' name. Good afternoon to each and everyone present. On behalf of Pastor Howard Simon and Pastor Lester Jews and the Seventh-day Adventist congregation on the island of Anguilla, we extend our deepest condolences to Philbert's family, friends, and well wishes on the passing of Stanelius and his father. We know that you would have lost two giants in the family. However, we encourage you to have faith in God and he will see you through this time of loss. The two songs we'll be singing will be a testament to Brother Stan's contribution here on the island of Anguilla, whether it was in youth ministry or music ministry, we trust that you will be blessed.
Okay, good day once again. We have decided to cut it short because it's getting a little bit lengthy. So we'll go to the, the second part of the program, at least some of the contributions that are coming are from the same people. So we are very grateful and thankful for such a contribution. And now we'll get ready for the second part of the service. Brother Mervyn, can you get our people up here, those who have to come up? Okay. All right. In the meantime, we're going to have a little prison worship. Um, we are here to do one thing. You have any idea what we are here to do? You have any idea what we are here to do? We're going to celebrate, indeed. Are we going to celebrate? Okay, we're here to celebrate. So my praise team will come and help me do something. In the meantime, can Pastor D'Souza come and join me, please? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very, very much for coming and for your patience. At this time, I would invite Pastor D'Souza to lead us in a word of prayer as we officially start this program. But well, let's all rise as we pray. Thank you. Our Father and our God, we pause a while to acknowledge your presence. For surely and definitely, Lord, it is because of the graces of your presence that we were able to have made it safely thus far. And therefore, we uh, honor you and we glorify you for this. At this time, we commit the service into your care. Uh, what has preceded and what will continue, we just pray that through your presence and through the person of the Spirit, you will truly... Uh, provide the opportunity and the environment where we can celebrate uh, two wonderful lives and we can truly uh, learn through the experience. Again, we commit every uh, part of the service into your hand and ask that you would help provide a smooth transition so that we all would be able to truly uh, benefit and may the name and the, the grace of God be upon the immediate family as you continue to provide him with your peace, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Pastor. And so I would like to welcome you in a very special way for coming and share this moment with us. It's such an honor to have you. And if Daddy and Stan were here on the platform, they'll say, really? So on behalf of Stan, Daddy, and all of us, let me tell you, thanks for coming. And today is not so much a day of mourning, but it's a day of a rejoicing. It's a day to reflect on the wonderful things that Probably the lovely things that these folks have left that you can reflect on. And as we do so, let's lift our spirits, knowing that we are not those without hope, but we live with a hope that tomorrow can be better than today. Let my priest team take you through the second round. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord and thus surround the throne. We are... Marching to Zion. Y'all think y'all going to make me cry today? Y'all better sing, brethren. Okay? Marching to Zion. It's in your leaflets, please. Read along, sing along. Let's celebrate awesome lives tonight. Together, come we. Join in the 
Sis. You want to join me? Listen. Amen. Master, listen, we're singing some of Stan's and Daddy's favorite songs. So I'm going to just go down here now and tell you. Master, the tempest is raging. Let's sing it together because we know the master of the seas, the hills, and the storm. Peace, peace, be still. assurance great is thy faithfulness do I hear an amen? amen great is thy faithfulness 
Oh God, my Father, how are we getting through this today? Because we serve a God that is faithful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Together. Great is thy faith. started and we done more no more no more <laughs> all right thank you very much are you still here to praise the lord no, we got the i just felt like singing this one i just came to praise the lord i didn't hear you join me now let's go i just came to praise the lord that's right i just came to praise his holy We do that one more time, and I want you to give me the wave offering. Let's go. I just came. I just came to praise the Lord. That's right. We got in there. I just came. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to praise. 
Amen. Thank you very much. God be praised. And if you cannot give him the praise, then there's something wrong. Amen. Let's stand together for our opening hymn, our continuation hymn. One of daddy's favorites, an evening prayer. It is in your leaflets. I'll invite you to stand with us as we sing. <coughs> together. If I have wounded tiny soul today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deborah Dolor, and I'm here to pay tribute to Daddy Filbert and Brother Stan in the form of a poem that I wrote entitled, Ah, Death. Ah, Death. So you've boldly struck again. Once more, you've brought to us a whole heap of pain. Although we expected you, but surely not so soon. You've taken not one, but two, who won't be here to enjoy another rising of the moon. Though you are inevitable, it doesn't lessen the blow, when sadly from us, our loved ones have to go. You're no respecter of persons. You steal the lives of young and old. We hate that your cold grasp lessens on the loved ones in our fold. Yes, our loved ones and friends get ill, and they eventually pass away. And oh, how we wish with us they could forever stay. But we'd rather you than choose to see our loved ones suffer. So we resign and accept your death as a reprieve, as a buffer. Our death so often when you show up, you really make us cry. And to our Lord we turn and ask him, Father God, why? Yes, death, you're coming for many. Live such an awful void. Unfortunately, because of the scheme of things, you, we cannot avoid. We were supposed to live forever. That was the master plan. But when sin came, it brought penalty.
penalty and death, uh, that's how you began. In the midst of our suffering, though, there is comfort from the Lord. What we need to do is get acquainted with his holy word. In Matthew 5, we're told, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And after being comforted, in 2 Corinthians 1, we read how we should be comforted. John 11 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And that's the hope of God's children who are brokenhearted and who are tried. In Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Ah, death, this is the encouragement to help those who are sad to never give up, to never quit. For Psalm 116 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. This is the hope of the Christian who sadly mourns and who sometimes faints. For now we have no choice but to each bear our crosses. On this side of life, we will experience many losses, suffering and pain, sickness and disease. But hallelujah, one sweet day, all this will cease. Roman 8 reminds that God works all things out for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to compare with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Yes, death, you see, God's love letter, the Bible, was given to us for many reasons. For hope in our summers, autumns, springtimes, and in our winter seasons. Ah, death, but guess what? I have news for you. Listen up a little. I've got something to share with you. You see, for God's children, the story doesn't end here. There's a day coming when you'll be dealt with too. Do you hear? Oh, death, hear this. It doesn't end in the grave. Not for any, both the lost and the saved. There's a day of reckoning coming for one and for all. And you're not exempt. You too one day will get a call. Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? That will be the proclamation someday. Aye, aye, aye. What a thing. So, death, do your do. Touch whomever you may. We will weep. We will moan. But we will also continue to pray. Ah, death, I tell you, someday you too will die. And there will be no more tears, no more reason for us to cry. For the former things, the Bible says, would have passed away. And all God's people will gather and with him forever stay. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, this was Deborah. We usually does the poem. He asked me to put the mic in the stand because he doesn't know how he's going to perform. So just be patient with him. Right, Wayne? Let's go, Wayne. It's a celebration, man. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon. Stanislas Philbert, popularly known to his classmates at the Beaufort Senior Secondary School as Stan was a constant in our lives. If our late famous teacher back then in our days would dare call teacher Peter so on and so forth but Stan yes. far and near called our dear teacher Peter vivers well, next morning at assembly, teacher Peter took his revenge. I recall teacher Peter saying at assembly, I know this voice. I know the person who called me Vivers. 
Yes, I know him. He has the finest voice in the whole school. And with a brief pause, teacher Peter said, Stanislas, pass out. Stan was shocked. He couldn't believe someone through voice recognition. Long before AI, voice recognized him. Well, Stan paid the price. He danced around like a top. Why, you ask? Use your imagination. We also recall Stan coming to school with a hard-covered romance novel. The front page glazed with the picture of a beautiful girl and a handsome boy. His classmates, all eager to open the book, hopefully to see or read something juicy, teenage stuff, you know. Only upon opening with much excitement and anticipation, you would receive an electric shock. Stan would occasionally show off his grace with his musical skills. He would come to school with his keyboard, the songs and rhythms of the most contemporary tunes. Oh, what amazement. We would all surround him and sing along at school. We also recall Stan's love for electronics and electricity. This began at a very early age all influenced by his father, Mr. Philbert, who now rests peacefully alongside Stan. At an early age, as little boys growing up in the back of there, we would salvage music, music boards, resistors, switches, and bulbs from the Lambushi by the seaside, things you know Fenwall and Carriman would discard. Stan would revive those electronic parts and make dead bulbs light. He would make the music boards sing. Our wooden trucks or the carboways would be fitted with headlights and indicators and so on. Such was the dedication and love of electricity for electricity and electronics by Stan. This little back of the boy would one day involve, evolve as a real man, ended practicing his chosen profession as an electrician. I recall the sports fanatic in Stan, early days growing up in the back of day. If you had the Philbert brothers on your team, even before football match ended, we knew who won the game. With the likes of Trevor and Lynn and Mervyn and Stan and sometimes Claudius and Albert, no match. Even before the game, we know we won. At the Viewfort Senior Secondary School, Stan was not loud. He was not bold and aggressive with his presence, but Stan had a particular character, a particular essence. If I may describe Stan from Senior Sec days, slightly comical, gracefully mischievous. He was not an academic bright star, but he had enough light in his life to deal and live honestly with his peers and teachers. And to stand and his peers, that was very important. Love, honesty, peace, hard work. His record was without blemish. No one would object to stand being in the group. The days in the valley, the days in the lab, the days on the school farm. When Stan went wrong, Stan was never accused. But there was no one more guilty than Stan. But how would you know? He knew how to conceal his mischievousness with his expressionless face. Sometimes, that is, sometimes. And talking about his face and expressions, Mate was always smiling. He once told me, just knowing that his soul is well with the Almighty was enough reason to be joyous. I repeat. Stan once told me, just knowing that his soul is well with the Almighty was enough to be joyous. I once posted a comment in our chat group on WhatsApp. Within seconds, Stan messaged me privately and offered to have a discussion with me on the topic. Respectfully, we conversed, and I wish to stress on the word respectfully. 
No one, not at school, not within his past students' community or even the back of the community can point a finger at stand on issue of respect or being disrespectful. No one. It was the epitome of grace. He would greet you and you would feel the genuineness in his greeting. He would ask about parents and family. You felt the love. It wasn't robotic. It was coming from his heart. In December 2022, we organized a class reunion. Stan paid his dues to attend, but due to his illness, he did not make it. But keeping true to his nature, he asked that it, we transfer his dues to any other classmate. Stan never asked who we paid for. It, was, it wasn't his character. Even while battling the dreaded disease, Stan would occasionally grace us with his presence online. He even posted a short video of himself playing his keyboard and singing at the same time. But don't think Stan wasn't getting annoyed. At school, I can recall Stan, I cannot recall Stan ever getting over a little crafty joke when we played English language with his name. To annoy Stan at school, and I will do it one last time, Stan, in your presence. When he was standing, we would say, stand, sit. <laughs> and when he was seated, we would shout, stand, stand. <laughs> Despite his complexion, he would turn blue. Our classmates, the class of 1986-87, we will surely miss Stan. Stan seasoning, the Stan seasoning you added to our lives, the brief moment in time you spent with us, we thank you, your family, for sharing you with us. To Stan's wife and sons, to Miss Marcella, his mom, to his brothers and sisters and extended family, our condolences. We know you like, you know you like us, you know you like us will miss Stan and Mr. Philbert. Especially to his nieces and nephews, your grandfather, Mr. Philbert, left a solid foundation. Stan built on it. Now it's your turn to build further. I wish to close with this very short poem. I lived my life. I've tried my best. The memories I hold dear are experiences I've known of happiness and tears. I love the love of my family the care of my friends, the good times I've shared right to the end. I've never traveled life's byways, seen children grow, experienced life's living, and drunk from love's cup. I leave you with memories, with thoughts of you all. I'm no longer with you, but your mind will recall the good times we shared, the laughter we had. Please cherish these memories and don't be sad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. Usually when you work a particular place, um, you usually find that after you've left, then you're no, you're no longer important. And one of the things I could say as a son, and that is relationship with the workers at Lustilek, is that they never lost touch with him. And it's something that I can really speak about, whether it was full-time workers or those who were the contract workers, these guys would always stay in touch with Daddy. Representing Lucilek is a gentleman who knows Daddy not just in the position that he's in right now, but when Daddy was area supervisor and before he was his immediate supervisor. And so I think there is no other person who can speak uh, about that, but Mr. Gurren Pilti. Let's welcome Mr. Gurren Pilti, present interim manager of Lucilek. Good, good afternoon. As Lynn indicated, I am Gilroy Pilti. I'm the managing director, designate of, of Lucilek. I had, I had the privilege of working directly with Mr. Philbert as his boss. I tend not to like to use the word boss, but as his boss, for a brief period in the mid-90s, when I was assigned to the South as the engineer responsible for the Lucilex Southern transmission and distribution operations. 
having introduced myself and made the connection to Mr. Filbert, I would like to extend my deepest condolences to the Filbert family on behalf of myself, the board, management, and staff of, of Lucilec. We acknowledge his loss and, the, and that of his son and extend our sympathies to his son's family as well. I also convey regrets on behalf of our current managing director, Mr. Trevor Luizzi, and our former managing director, Mr. Bernard Tibbles, who are both currently out of state and unable to be present with us today. The quote, a life well lived, is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter, better place, resonates deeply when reflecting upon the remarkable life and contributions of Mr. Filbert. Before my assignment to the South, Mr. Filbert served as the senior TND supervisor, transmission and distribution, that is, and had overall responsibility for the Lucilex Southern TND operations. Despite lacking a formal engineering education, his knowledge, experience, and ability equaled, and I would add surpassed, that of a qualified engineer. Despite being his superior, my experience in operations was very limited, and Mr. Filbert played a crucial role in my development by willingly sharing the vast experience he had acquired. Today, I feel honored to pay a small tribute to him, drawing upon the, the insights shared by esteemed individuals such as our first managing director, Mr. Bernard Tibbles, our current managing director, Mr. Trevor Luizzi, Mr. Francis Daniel, a former t and manager, Michael Ambrose, a former lineman, now serving as a supervisor, and a few others. Mr. Luizzi highlighted that Mr. Filbert was a consummate professional, a sentiment echoed by all of us who had the opportunity to work with him. He was not only an expert in electricity distribution, but also excelled in writing, a rare combination. That really impressed me. His commitment to continuous growth and excellence was evident in all that he was involved in, and I have no doubt that he read a lot and kept his mind engaged. During my visit with Linus Francis shortly before his passing, we marveled at the sharpness of his memory which provided some comfort in knowing that an active mind can stave off dementia. Mr. Filbert's strong faith in God was apparent when we visited, and as I knew all along, as he prayed and requested our prayers for him, he expressed readiness to depart while leaving a glimmer of hope for recovery. There is no question that Mr. Filbert was a giant in the electricity supply business, as noted by Mr. Tibbles. He played a significant role in ensuring that every part of the country was made brighter and better through electricity. During the challenging times of the 70s and 80s, according to Mr. Tibbles again, before the unification of the overhead line system, Beaufort and the South faced numerous hardships, such as limited resources, lack of trained manpower, technical support, materials, vehicles, and other basic necessities that are often taken for granted today. Even access on a long and difficult road left the South virtually on its own to make do. Employees like Leo Burt, James Burt, and Mr. Henry Filbert, with Matthew Saldibus at the Beaufort Power Plant, carried the day, and all of us, latecomers, and all consumers owe them a debt can, that can never be paid. Again, according to Mr. Thibbles, Mr. Filbert's selflessness and unwavering loyalty to his work were remarkable. He belonged to the old school of Lucilex's early days, alongside Leo Burt and James Burt, and quietly earned the reputation for his total commitment and reliability. Mr. Filbert was renowned for his unassuming nature and his ability to carry out his duties without fuss or exhibition. Raised voices or altercations were unheard of from him, and he never complained about the demands placed on him. He embodied the true essence of a loose select man. Francis Daniel, a former TND manager, as I indicated, shared similar sentiments, emphasizing Mr. Filbert's unflappable composure in the face of challenges, as well as his soft-spoken and humble demeanor, which made him truly remarkable. He instilled a strong work ethic amongst his staff 
resulting in a distinctive, effective, efficient, and beneficial approach to the company's operations. Mr. Filbert's legacy lives on through the competent staff members he influenced in both the northern and southern regions, and there are lots of them all around. And if I had to name them, it would be too many, but I, I would just indicate that both myself and Francis Daniel are part of that legacy, both of us being his boss at one time. Michael Ambrose recounted powerful anecdotes that further exemplify the strong work ethic Mr. Filbert instilled amongst his staff and contractors. In one instance, in the early stages of Michael Ambrose's career, Mr. Filbert assigned a team which included seasoned individuals like Maxwell, better known as Pigeon, the task of installing a transformer. Not long after, Mr. Filbert encountered them at the office and inquired about their presence there. They explained that they had halted their work due to the rain. To their surprise, Mr. Filbert asked, didn't the company provide you guys with raincoats? He instructed them to retrieve their raincoats, and even those who didn't have or could not find theirs joined the team in the rain to load the transformer onto the truck. Upon completion, they turned to the office, all of them slightly annoyed and complaining, noting it was only Mr. Filbert who could get them to go out in the rain that day. That incident serves as a testament to the immense respect and trust that the staff had for Mr. Filbert, despite some members of the team being known for their militant nature. Furthermore, Ambrose highlighted Mr. Filbert's dedication to resolving plant outages promptly. He would arrive at the site just before the designated time, assess the pro progress, and personally address the contractor, stating, the corporal has arrived. It's time to wrap up. His presence and diligence played a pivotal role in ensuring the timely restoration of services, emphasizing his commitment to operational efficiency and customer satisfaction. Beyond his professional expertise, Mr. Filbert displayed care and compassion towards his colleagues. Each morning, he would start his rounds from the trouble call office, greeting each person at their desk and inquiring about their families. This small gesture demonstrated his genuine concern for the well-being of his co-workers and for fostered a supportive and positive work environment. And I believe that perhaps is one of the reasons he was able to get the team to go out in the rain. In conclusion, Mr. Filbert's life exemplified the quote, a life well lived is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace. Through his unwavering commitment, selflessness and compassion, he made St. Lucia a brighter and better place. His legacy will continue to inspire and guide us. We are forever grateful for the privilege of knowing and working alongside him, and we again extend our deepest condolences to the Filbert family during this difficult time. Thank you. At this time, we welcome the Inspirational Pilgrims, a group that did quite a bit of work with, to bless us with a special number. Fourteen computer.
We have no audio from the computer.
Man, that song so much like the 80s, the 90s, you know? You thought it was bad, bad, bad back then, it's better. Now you just say yak, 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 clack, 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 no value. Back then, we're going to have a good time. I hear you say amen. Okay, let's welcome Examine. She'll take us through her tribute. Hazimin. but hardly heard him. This tall, strapping, confident, compassionate, hardworking, and charitable man, Henry Filbert, known to many as Hamilton, Mr. Filbert, Philly, and maybe you did not know, Fraton, but to his nieces and nephew as simply uncle. As children, uncle functioned as our father figure. He assisted in our socialization. He helped nurtured and molded us. He touched our hearts and soul. Uncle was a disciplinarian, yet loving, gentle, affectionate, compassionate, humble, and caring. I have deliberately chosen to focus on four areas of uncle that really impacted on our life. The first one, respect. Uncle respected everyone irrespective of your status, your position, or your age. As a respectful individual, he inculcated the values of respect in all of us. He stressed on respect for self, for others, for property, and time. Uncle never took time for granted, and never bought into the St. Lucian time philosophy. Consequently, he was very punctual. Uncle encouraged us to believe in ourselves, and engage in behaviors which would not compromise our integrity on character. Unlike a lot of individuals, especially now, we could not enjoy the privilege of taking home anything which was not purchased for us. It could be as small as a pencil. You had to return it. Today, we better understand the power and the principles of this practice, and we are grateful for the lessons taught and learned. Number two, unconditional love for family. Uncle has always been supportive of his family. The Philbert family is one of strong, confident, assertive, and may I add, even stubborn personalities. Uncle was able to embrace all of us and love each one of us unconditionally, nonetheless. Uncle was always available for his siblings and their children. He assisted financially, as well as with his time, his energies, and other forms of support. He never complained. But instead, he was always ready to be of service to his family. He supported our dreams, ambitions, and our goals. In case he did not support a particular position or activity which we took, Uncle respected our decision, but was still available to offer guidance. Uncle remained non-judgmental. I remember as a child, Uncle worked at Lucilec, the power station somewhere by the view for docks. On either side of the pair, I think this was the most beautiful beach Buford ever had. Uncle took us to this beach every Sunday for Sunday picnics. I particularly enjoyed his family moments and they remain etched in my mind. Uncle assisted our business ventures. He helped the caring of our children and of course always checked on us. We couldn't have asked for a better champion for our family. Uncle had an enormous heart and soul and embodied the principles of selfless love and sacrifice for his family in the humblest of ways. The third area is the value of trust. Uncle had that unique gift of being truly trustworthy. You could discuss anything with uncle and you can rest assured that absolutely no one would know. There was never an incident of uncle being accused of breaking anyone's trust or confidence in him. Further irrespective of whatever happened in our family. Uncle was the go-to person for peace, and anyone would confide in him. My final area, Uncle's faith in God. Uncle always implored us to believe, trust, and have faith in God in all circumstances. I vividly remembered when my mother died suddenly. Well, just like all her other siblings. I had a million questions for God as to why he took her away when I needed her the most. 
Uncle called every morning and came home for months, trying to encourage, motivate, assure, and comfort us to trust and to have faith in God. At the beginning, that did not make any sense, but Uncle never gave up on us. Though we are adults, Uncle put our needs before his. If you for one spot that these were just biblical words for uncle, you had to think again. I never had the witness, the, I had never witnessed any family member being sick and suffering till death. That period of illness for uncle was difficult for all of us. But God had a, gave us a unique opportunity to witness uncle embrace the principle of having faith in God in all circumstances. Uncle never complained about his illness nor his pains or suffering. Uncle maintained his faith in God. Even in his illness and pain, he continued to trust God. Uncle prayed frequently and gave God and asked God to give him strength to bear the pain. He asked, he found God and gave God and asked God for forgiveness. When asked, Uncle, how are you? Uncle responded, Mimin, I am not the best, but I'm not the worst. I am holding on by God's grace. And I thank God for waking up this morning. In all the pain, he continued thanking God for waking up every morning. I don't know how uncle did it, but praise God for uncle's faith. Uncle, you live a life where you are an example to us. You inspired and motivate us. You live a life of service for others. Though painful on May 9th, God decided, quoting from David Fields, no more nights, no more pains. No more tears, no more crying again. God called you home because you have fought a good fight. You have finished your race. You kept the faith. Now there is in store for you, uncle, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward you. Uncle, it is well with your soul. You have left an indelible mark in our hearts. Thanks for being a role model. Thanks for the support, the love, and the guidance. I will remember you. I will also remember Stan. Stan, let that smile shine. Play music in heaven while you and uncle go and have some electrical fun and lighting up there. You too, Stan, was strong in your faith. Rest in peace, uncle and Stan, in God's embrace until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zizmin. Okay, all right. We have Sarah Gaste now, and she will be the sister of Ketura. Come on, Sarah. You need a hand? Sarah! Good day, everyone. Stan. Stanislaus, Uncle Stan, as he was affectionately known, was not just a brother-in-law or son-in-law. He was truly a son to our parents and a tried and true brother to us. When he married into the family almost 30 years ago, he fitted right in. There was never a dull moment whenever Stan was around. The grandkids in the family, they loved their Uncle Stan to death. Upon his passing, they couldn't contain themselves and it was heartbreaking to see how much they did cry. The person Stan was to us was a giving, sacrificial, jovial, straightforward, and multi-talented young man. At the time he laid eyes on his fair maiden, his shabbing, his wife-to-be, he was a good friend of our late brother Francis and would be invited to have Sabbath lunch with us together with his other two brothers. When the intention was made to our late dad to get permission to date his daughter, he went into old school mode. Nevertheless, he was outnumbered by all of us and he just had to give in. He was able to gain her hand in marriage and seal the deal in September of 1993. Their marriage produced four boys and one daughter-in-law. There are countless stories, memories, sacrifices and blessings that we can share about our time with Stan our Uncle Stan, but time will not suffice. We are and will forever be grateful for the bond that the Augustine and Philbert families have shared and continue to share. I will venture to say that the interactions with Daddy Philbert and Mommy Philbert together with the Augustine matriarch and patriarch 
that our families will keep that bond intact for as long as it is possible. We take comfort in knowing that stands as well as that the Philbert suffering is over, that they were ready to go to sleep. Stan's last words to me when he was taking his final breaths were, Auntie Sarah, all I want to do is sleep. I just want to go to sleep. We will forever cherish the memories of both Uncle Stan and Daddy Philbert with our families. We will and have already missed the Philbert men. I am forced to recall a moment when Stan and my late dad had a discussion that was biblical in nature. Neither one was given in and they reached a mood point. Then my late dad, with nothing more to add, called Stan Moses, which Stan in turn, he looked at him and called him Pharaoh. All that was left to do was just burst into laughter. From that day on until my dad's passing in 2021, they addressed each other as Moses and Pharaoh. In the behalf of the Augustine family, sleep on Uncle Stan, sleep on Daddy Philbert, until the resurrection morning when we shall behold your faces again. Now Pharaoh is sleeping. <clears throat> and Moses is also sleeping. Today, Stan's work in St. Lucia was not just limited to the south of the island, but he's, he was far-reaching island-wide and elsewhere. And representing the St. Lucia Mission of Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist is the president. So let me now welcome Elder Roger Stevens to share a few words with us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Death was never part of God's original plan. Death is difficult because it is a loss. And the deeper our love, the greater our value and our relationship with someone is the more devastating and painful the experience when death comes. Today, the Philbert family has lost two precious members of their family. And though we all have come to support, and though we all can say to them, I understand what you go through, we truly can never fully understand the depth of the pain. However, the Philbert's family, I would like to say to you, according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, there is someone who understands, for he is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. I didn't know Brother Henry too well, except for when I visited the South, known him, him to be a very quiet and a very uh, wonderful individual. But I want to pay tribute to Stan. One I knew from very early in the music field. In the days when Adventist concerts were like a staple almost every Saturday evening. Stan was a unique and yet well he had a well-encompassing style in his music. And what he played always caught the ears of everyone around. He had the musical ability and was known to be a one-man full band. Whenever Stan took his seat at his keyboard, with all of his gadgets, if you didn't know, you would believe that there was a full band in the house. And when he played, he compelled the choristers to sing. And as a result, the audience had no choice but to sing. His music was neat, never seeking to overpower the voices. Stan was a humble musician, never showy nor conceited. He sought never to bring attention to self, 
But in all of his playing, he always sought to bring glory and honor to God. He was committed and consistent, always willing to assist even when he was not called upon. I remember when I pastored the Miko district in 2009, I planned the district crusade. And while I was thinking of who and who would have been the musicians, Stan met me and I started telling him about the crusade. And Stan told me, Pastor, if you want me, I will be there. So, of course, I told Stan we would welcome you. But not knowing that Stan would still maintain his principle of a one-man full band, I started speaking to other persons. Stan told me, Pastor, if you want me there, I will be alone. And alone he was. And he lit up this crusade with so much. What a wonderful time we had with Stan. And in 2022, just on the heels of the shutdown, I was in St. Thomas preaching a crusade. And the first night, the music was not all well organized. And Stan, his wife, Katura, and sons were there. After the first night of the crusade, Stan came to me and told me, Pastor, we will be here from tomorrow evening to play for you. And Stan brought his instruments, he and his sons. They came and they played for the entire crusade. And I, had just, I just had so much appreciation even for what Stan had done. Stan was an authentic Adventist musician. He was not those who would like to color his music with a lot of notes. But he was a legendary, a man of God. He was selfless for the cause of Christ. Stan made an invaluable contribution to the St. Lucia mission in the area of his music. And as a result of his contribution, we know the quality that we have in St. Lucia is as a result of the contribution that Stan would have made to St. Lucia over the years. He truly has made and left a mark. And we have no doubt that his legacy will definitely continue through his sons and through the many that he would have impacted and inspired over the years. To his supportive wife, Sister Ketura, and sons, all of the siblings, mother, we know it is difficult. But in the words of Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry said, he whose head is in heaven need not fear to put his feet in the grave. And because his head was always in heaven, in heavenly places, even while in St. Thomas, as we spoke, Stan told me that he has no fear because he has made all things well with his maker. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, we read where Paul says, one of these good days, this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal will put on immortality, and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And because of this promise, I say to all of you, the Philbert family, and to all of us who are here and those viewing online, keep trusting in God. May our faith remain in God because his promises are sure. One of these good days, we shall see Stan and his dad again. What a great waking up morning that will be. God bless all of you. Thank you very much, Pastor. And to sweeten it up, Let's call four young ladies from the SD Academy to bless us with song.
It's not what I prayed for, it's not what I wanted, it's not something I understand. My circumstances seem so confusing, I'm placing it all in your hand. Your ways are higher. Than mine. I want mountains to move. You want me to climb. So I'm gonna trust you will work your will in your time. Your ways are higher than mine. One day I'm sure I'll look back and marvel on how we knew best all along. You see from heaven, you know it's the hard times that makes our faith steady and strong. Your ways are higher than mine. So I'm gonna trust you will work your will in your time. Your ways are higher than mine. When I start to doubt, help me believe somewhere so far above me. Your ways are higher than mine. I want mountains to move. You want me to climb. So I'm gonna trust you will work your will in your time. Oh, your way. So much higher than mine. Your ways are higher than mine. Thank you very much. Right now, I want to call on Danny Boy. A young man stand you as a little boy. Danny Boy. Oh, Danny Boy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to do the tribute on behalf of the Viewfort Seventh-day Adventist Church for Brother Stan, for Brother Stan and Brother Philbert Sr. When we heard about the passing of the Philbert son and father in close succession, time stopped. So laden was the news that nothing else mattered. Every local news, national, international issue, somehow was not as important than the manner in which we would have to maneuver this existential crisis brought upon us. Since then, my mind has been inundated with special memories of how Brother Stand and his dad made the Adventist experience a treasured adventure. Upon much reflection of their love, compassion, wit, energy, commitment, and dedication to the cause of God, 
I have concluded that some tributes should not be stained with tears, but with godly strength, smile at the perfect punctuation of death. It is not a fable. It is not a folk tale. It's a timeless truth that we will see Stan and Daddy Filbert again. At the universe's greatest family reunion, yes. the second coming of Jesus Christ. Brother Stan and Brother Filbert were a dynamic duo. In many ways the same and interestingly so different. Brother Filbert Sr. was a pioneer of Southern Adventism. He was one of the first noted figures of the Adventist faith in the Viewfort community. Clothed in his trademark shirt jack, well ironed dress pants, sharp seams perpendicular to each other, he was a patriarchal figure of the church which represented discipline, respect, honor, and pride. At the time when, Ad when the Adventist church was still in its budding stages in Viewfort, but the Philbert allowed God to use him as a vessel to nurture the Adventist message into full bloom. Those who worked with him in the local church during those years summarized him as a voice of reasoning, the objective listener on any church committee he sat on, and a man who was regimen in principle and stood for correctness even though the heavens may fall. He demonstrated the passage of scripture righteousness by faith in the life that he lived. His faith was deep as well as abiding. He did not only speak of the goodness of God, he lived the goodness of God. He did not only knew the gospel, he unapologetically shared the gospel. Even post-retirement at a new dispensation in his life, as an entrepreneur on Clark Street, he could, be, he could still be heard very calmly, with seemingly no venom or ill will, sharing his faith with anyone who granted him an audience. A man of quiet disposition, but powerful scriptural content. His contributions to Sabbath school lessons were thought-provoking, salient, doctrinally sound, and edited from the newsroom of heaven. And when the teacher asked, daily studied, you could be rest assured Brother Filbert's hand would go up. When Brother Filbert was at church, there was no such thing as a hymn not being known. He knew every song in the Adventist hymnal, and even, he even knew songs that they left out of the hymnal. He was, he was committed to church liturgy, and church worship, we felt safe with Brother Filbert. This great stalwart of faith and righteousness left us many gifts, but one so precious, undeniable present, he gave us lives on in the presence, a legacy of faithful children who are dedicated to the cause of Christ. On July 16, 2018, his son, Brother Stan Filbert, honoring his dad on Father's Day, wrote on Facebook, I grew up admiring my dad. When I quizzed him of what he meant, he said his father was a great example of what men, of how men should take care of their family. He loved his wife. He loved his children. He loved us equally. He was not perfect, but we knew he loved us. He disciplined us when he had to, but he was kind as well. And such are the fruits of Brother Filbert's labor. He gave us musicians, educators, entrepreneurs, preachers, teachers, singers. Adventism is a better movement because you gave us gifted, talented men and women who serve the Lord wholeheartedly. That was for Brother Filbert and for Brother Stan. An infectious sound, of, an infectious sound floods the view for church. Something hitting notes on a keyboard out of sight in the church vestry, trying to keep up with church members as they sang. Music from the beyond, magical fingers dedicated for anointed service. That boy Stan began a music ministry par excellence. I'm still not sure whether he was hiding or whether he was there because there was no dedicated space for the musicians on the altar. But for a time, the source of music remained mysterious. That is, until the keyboard player 
emerged from the tiny hot room of the vestry to the front of the church with a tiny keyboard. And, and like they say, the rest is history. Over the years, stand proved indispensable to worship services and other activities at our congregation. Unfortunately, we had to share him with the rest of the island church because he would be requested to play for crusades, concerts, and other special events, even traveling overseas with pastors. He is an ever-willing accompanist to any singer, and with his musical talent, made average singers legends. Many other times, singers would call Stan on Friday night with the words, I have a song for tomorrow. Do you know this song? He would say, I've heard it before. Let us see what happens tomorrow. On the appointed morning, the singer would begin to sing, confident by the end of the first verse that he would have it on lock. And surely, he always did. His example of dedication to ministry did not go unnoticed. On one occasion, newly married with a month-old boy baby, he was asked to play at a crusade in Sufre. Eliza, the appeal singer, Stan accepted the calling and nightly, Eliza, he, Eliza, and his family all traveled to Sufre back to Viewfort for six weeks. That's how much he loved what he did and his new family just as important. His contributions to Viewford Church was not only in the area of music. He served practically in every department of the church. He gave the best children's stories, the most inspiring object lessons. He made sermons and drew inspirations and gave long life lessons from everything. I remember how he made sermons and gave us spiritual lessons from every item, thermometers, vehicles, his family, the church ceiling fan, and even once a wheelbarrow. I remember how he gave a sermon on, on the ceiling fan on repentance. He served with dedication as a first elder, an AY leader, personal ministries leader, and family life director. Speaking of family, he gave brilliant marriage advice, especially to newlyweds, about love, care, and conflict resolution. I was not married as yet when I referred to him and Ketra as a power couple. In simple response and stand like fashion, he said, the same way you walk to church with your wife when you are happy with her is the same way you walk to church with her when you are upset at her. No one should know there is an issue. No one should spot the difference. And that's the essence of the man. But there was a classical piece of advice he gave to every new couple. I remember when I got married, Stan told me to purchase a table with four chairs. He said the very same thing to my brother-in-law, Marcus. When I asked why, he said, he said, the more chairs you have, Danzig, the more children you will have. <laughs> At the time, I thought the advice was simple humor, and I bought and I had a table of chair, and I had a table with six chairs. By the second year of my marriage, I had one child, and then another. And then I remembered Stan's advice. With much haste, I made, I, with much haste, I did away with the table with six chairs and got a table with four. I should let you know that Marcus kept the table with six chairs and now has four children. Stan was right. Everyone saw him as a big brother. His famous, his famous introduction, hello there, followed by a beaming smile accompanied with his charismatic dis dis deportment, a special character. He defended you, but he also teased you. So you must be on your P's and Q's or else he would remind you of your mishaps. He possessed a contagious laughter. And when he was done laughing at your expense, he would say, okay, boys and girls, and that was the cue that it was time for work. Brother Stan had the unique ability to reprimand with a smile. He administered discipline like a good medicine. And when, he, and when he pointed out one's mistake, you never felt broken, you felt renewed. He worked diligently when he convict, when, and when he was convicted of a purpose, he spared no effort to accomplish a task. There was a time as personal ministries leader he placed a huge speaker on his vehicle 
in an attempt to share the good news of the gospel as he drove in the community. He had a genuine love for young people. He opened his home every Tuesday for Bible study, ses for Bible study. sessions I would never miss, partly because his wife, Ketra, served much needed refreshments after. Eliza said Sabbath afternoons would find us, the young people of the church, at his family home with his siblings, rehearsing or just fooling around with the music. At one point, someone had the bright idea that we should form a group. That was the most defining growth experience for me. Stan was at the center of it all as a musician. It was always a joy to sing as he played. Our group went everywhere together. Crusades, concerts, church visitations, the beach, night socials, and even Sunday morning exercises. Stan could play, but he could also sing. But he, would, but he could not be trusted with the mic because he could never remember the words. His happy was the keyboard. He impacted on our lives through music, and this will always be treasured. Vita Belfort said, legacy is not what I did for myself, but what I'm doing for the next generation. And the next generation is now. Because his son Vance is now the one who sets worship alive at the View for Church and the one who makes average singers into legends. And like his dad, he is always willing. To Stan's family, our heart broke into a million pieces for you. But in conversations with Ketra, she assured me that Stan was ready. He faced death fearlessly. He said, with death, the devil may knock me down, but the devil has not knocked me out. He lived his final season in, poet in poetic fashion. To, uh, in poetic fashion. Ketra told me how he led a karaoke session with the nurses at the hospital. They sang, Stan played. They sang, Stan played. And to everyone who visited him, he gave them much encouragement. And when he had enough, he sur surrounded with prayer and the reassuring him of it is well with my soul. Our stand went to sleep with the Lord. But be he comforted in knowing that your son, your father, your brother, our friend, lived on his terms, found enjoyment in the language of heaven which is music, and left a lasting legacy touching the lives of everyone. And if I could just borrow from Wayne Harrow's tribute, Stan will not sit, Stan will not stand, but Stan will rise again. Be ye comforted. Thank you, Danny Boy. And a fraction of the group that used to meet under our house on a Saturday afternoon to sing, the group that was formed was called the Gospel Heralds. And so we have put a few persons together to just represent the Gospel Heralds, and they'll do for us the song, We've Come This Far by Faith.
Come this far by faith. Our scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25, and Exodus 13, 19. The Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you to this land, unto the land which out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. And Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19, the Bible says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bone away hence with you. May I invite you to stand with me? We've been sitting for a while. Can we just stand and take a stretch? Thank you so much. You may even take a deep breath. Please be seated. Yes, we, we are told that um, a lot of us shorten our lives by the length of time that we remain seated. And very often now it is being recommended that Desks are created which allow persons to stand rather than sit. I'm very glad at this point to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Pastor Elwin St. Rose. Uh, we, we, we go back, way back to the 80s, in the years when it was still CUC. But in the interest of time, let me just read for you what I have here. Pastor Elwin St. Rose has been a minister for the past 37 years. And many of you will recall the many times crusades were conducted all over the island and people followed him wherever he went, from castries and from all over the place. Early in his ministry, he pastored the Viewfort District, during which time he met the Filbert family. The relationship that was formed back then has remained and endured to this day. Upon leaving St. Lucia, he pursued studies at Andrews University in Michigan and graduated with two master's degrees. He then pursued doctoral studies in clinical psychology at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He went on to join the United States Air Force as a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, having been credentialed by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. While serving in the United States Air Force, he also pastored in the Allegheny West Conference of SDA in Columbus, Ohio, and served on the executive committee for three years. 
He retired early in 2014 from the Allegheny West Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He served also in the United States Air Force until he retired on October 1st, 2021. Currently, he is pursuing a dual graduate degree at the University of Central Florida. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the task of bringing hope and comfort to a family in grief, which happens to be his friends, weighs deeply upon him. We pray that God will grant him strength and insight to be a blessing to us. After the special music, Pastor St. Rose will speak to the family and to the rest of us. I invite you to hear ye him. I'd like to extend my condolences to the family. And I know you know this song, so feel free to sing along. God has promised to be with us through it all when we are going through such trying times. Amen. Thank you. 
through it all. Yes, through it all, I have learned to depend upon his word. I've had many tears and sorrows, says the song. I've had questions about today and tomorrow. And there, there has been times when I didn't even know right from wrong. But in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the chaos, I found something which is like a pearl of great price. I have learned to depend upon God's word. In 1991, the East Caribbean Conference decided to send me to the island of Dominica in the city of Roseau to do a national campaign. By, the, by that time, I had gotten to know Stan. I used to tease him about his magical fingers. I'd never seen anybody make the piano say uncle. <laughs> Stan did. And I wanted him to go to Dominica with me in 1991. But the East Caribbean Conference would not give me a budget for a musician. I told Stan I needed him in Dominica with me. I was going for seven weeks. Stan had two weeks of leave. He took his two weeks of leave and he took five weeks without pay to go to Dominica with me and the 400 persons who became members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would have never become were it not for Stan. Who does that? Who takes leave from their work without pay to go and play in the kingdom of God? I know somebody who did. Yes, sir. Stanislaus Philbert. And it didn't matter what exams I had and what I was doing in Florida. I would find myself in St. Lucia. That's right. To celebrate my friend. Stan Philbert. Today, I have decided to speak to you on the subject, the promise, the process, and the plan. And I'm going to try and hurry through my presentation. We have two individuals to bury. I want to use as a text Genesis chapter 50, which was very ably read as our scripture reading. Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25, where the Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones from hence. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19. We are about 322 years later. In Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19, the Bible says, on the night of the Exodus, Moses took the bones of jo Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones away hence with you. My Father and my God added the words out of my mouth. And allow your people, even the Griffin family and the rest of us who are here in solidarity to be blessed. We ask it all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. My brothers and sisters and the Filbert family, today is a day of duality and contradiction. It's a day of celebration of life well lived, but also a day of confusion about life. It's a day of paying respects to two individuals who are examples of the best of humanity, but also a day of the experience of the grief that comes to humanity. A day of great tributes, but also a day of great loss. To the two of you sisters, Philbert, mothers, wives, grandmother, May the peace of God be with you and please, on behalf of my own family, many of whom are here today, and all of the friends and supporters who have come in solidarity with you, accept our warmest condolences to the degree that you can. To you, the children of brother and sister Philbert, and the children of my friend Stan, little brother Stan, and other grandchildren, the degree of your loss and the extent of your pain cannot be exaggerated, and I am very deeply sorry for it. I urge you, however, to not be dismayed, whatever be time. God will take care of you. Under his wings you shall abide. And yes, through those of us who love you, God Almighty will take care of you. I pray to God that you will emerge from this place and this experience today with a measure of will and strength and that it will be clarion clear to you that the future by the grace of God can be better than the past. When we speak of strength, we do not mean pretension and phoniness or ignoring the reality of the situation. We mean instead standing with your feet firmly planted on the ground and coping with the reality that life has handed you. While you ignore neither the grief nor the pain that comes with it. It means tapping into your human spirit for your God-given capability to be resilient and to keep your journey alive as you put one foot in front of the other. Yes, even one day at a time. And that's how God's blessings in your life will be maximized. I feel honored to be here with you today. The text of scripture that I have chosen that we read twice, Genesis 50, 24, 25, and Exodus 13, 19, we pray that it will encourage and comfort you during this very sad and awful time in your life and experience. I therefore pray that this experience will birth in you and in the rest of us optimism as we face a different and difficult future without your loved ones. Exodus 13, 19, places us on the night of the Exodus, when the people of God, even the Hebrews, are about to leave Egypt in the territory of Goshen and are heading to the promised land, even Canaan. Exodus, which literally means the movement of God's people or the coming out of, in this case, Egypt, where the people of God had been slaves for about 430 years, is about to take place. And we encounter in our text a strange and interesting event. In the midst of the hurry to get out of Egypt on that significant night, in the midst of the chaos and the confusion, Moses sent the elders of Israel to Joseph's grave. And they dug up his dry bleach bones protected it like they should and they carried Joseph's bones with them heading to the land of Canaan. Joseph was Jacob's son 
Jacob's second youngest son. He had been a slave in Egypt and he remained aware of that reality. And though he rose to the prominent position of governor and vice regent to Pharaoh and a brilliant mind and an economist in charge of Egypt's financial affairs and who effectively and efficiently managed Egypt's economy during a time of famine and financial crisis in the region, especially in Palestine and Canaan, Joseph never forgot who he was. Though immensely successful, he knew he was just a pilgrim and a stranger in a strange land. He never forgot his mission and his roots, but instead he understood that his position and success never created him. He was a pilgrim. And Egypt would never be his final home. He was by definition an identity, a child of God, a Hebrew, if you please. And Egypt could never be his permanent and final home. He had a pilgrim complex. His permanent home was the land of promise, even Canaan. We too, my brothers and sisters, must remember that our permanent home is not this world. Despite the house, the car, the job, the land, and the money in the bank, we are pilgrims and strangers down here. And we look for a better place to call home. Even a city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. But in order for us to understand Exodus 13, 19, if it's strange and interesting event on this important day, we must understand Genesis 50, 24, 25. We find Joseph rehearsing the promise that God made to his, to his great-grandfather Abraham and reminding his brothers and our leaders and other leaders of Israel that this promise that God had made, God would absolutely keep. Joseph declared to his brothers while invoking the authority and certainty of the promise that God would surely, no ifs, no buts, no ands, no babies, God will surely visit you. Even after he had died to get them out of Egypt to take them to the land of Canaan and grasping the promise by its strength and its supernatural, authentic and immutable nature, he made his request, carry my bones from here. Right. The writer of the Hebrews in the New Testament also recalls the same promise in Hebrews 6, when he writes that God wanted to, God wanted to let Abraham know the immutability of his counsel, and that his descendants would surely inherit the promise. That God Almighty would visit them and deliver them. He writes that God looked for something by which to swear an oath, to declare the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. God was looking. We go to court and we put our hands on the Bible to swear because the Bible is a greater authority. But when God was looking for something by which to make an oath, he found nothing. So God took the oath by his own name. And the writer of the Hebrews tells us God did that because God can never lie. Doesn't need a Bible. He stands on his own word, his own authority. And hence the reason why Joseph is rehearsing that promise, telling the elders of Israel that God will surely God will surely visit you and when he does your bones will not remain in slave soil my brothers and my sisters today I don't care where you are from it may be America or Australia or Australia it may be Canada or it may be Kanawang or the Canary Islands. I don't care where you are from. It may be Brazil or Belgium. This earth is slave soil. And for the people of God, hear me to you, the Philbert family, hear me well. Our bones will never remain in slave soil when God Almighty visits us. I want to raise three observations with you quickly. I'm hurrying. I am hurrying. Three observations. The first observation 
in verse 19 bravo 19b of exodus 13 when god makes a promise god surely keeps his promise joseph told his brothers don't worry about it god will be true because god cannot lie no doubts no ifs no maybes god shall surely visit you he declared because god has promised to do so having sworn it by his own name it was a promise of deliverance egypt was a strange saga and very difficult for the people of god to you the filbert family today is a strange saga and very difficult for you but in the midst of it all god has a promise of deliverance not just deliverance from today and its pain and its sorrow and its grief but god has a promise of deliverance to get us out of this sin curse earth yes, sir. we're dying will be dead they'll be dying will be dying no more and pain will be pain no more and grief will be grief no more and heartaches and heartbreaks will be heartaches and heartbreaks no more yes god shall deliver because he's promised it and he can never lie this terrible circumstance and experience in egypt Hemingwell, were not outside of god's arena and scope and sphere of influence nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing escapes his eye of scrutiny. Yes, Egypt was there with its pain, but God was also there and he was never absent. He may have been unseen, but not unfelt. He promised it and he was surely as you are born into this world, going to bring it to pass. So we have the promise and God being faithful to it. To you, the Philbert family, to each of you, the circumstances of your life today with its grief, its sorrow, and its pain are not outside of the purview of Almighty God. Like the children of Israel in Egypt, his oath is enduring, his promise is sure, and great is his faithfulness. I declare to you that God shall surely visit you. So remember his promise of deliverance when the chips are down. Remember his promise when you are in doubt. Remember his promise when you are tired. And by the way, you will get tired. Remember his promise that his word is true. Because God can never lie. Amen. But even though we have the promise, it does not miraculously and immediately resolve all the problems. Because like Israel in Egypt, we may have to wait. And this takes me to the second observation. Secondly, in, number, in, in verse 19a of Exodus chapter 15, although there is a promise and it is certain, there is also a process. Just, that includes death. Joseph says, children, I'm going to die. That's the process. I'm about to die. Death is part of the lifespan and part of the journey of life. The power of the promise of God allows us to accept life and its peril to include death, just as Joseph did. Joseph never fought the idea of death. He accepted it. He knew that death was inevitable, though temporary and transient. And he realized that it was nothing more than a transition from one life to the next. In the process of this life, my brothers and sisters, pain is the price we pay. In the process of this life, grief is what we feel and experience on May 28, 2023. In the process, sorrow is what we know as part of the human experience. In the process, loss is part of our everyday lives. Disconsolation and trepidation are found everywhere. In the process, the voice of, the voice of pain is heard everywhere. In the process, the voice of suffering is heard everywhere. In the process, the voice of sorrow and tragedy is heard and seen everywhere. The noise of our groaning from the process is heard everywhere. And like distant peals of thunder, they wax louder and louder as they get closer and closer to our space. We have no choice but to hang on as we lay hold of the promise to be reminded over and over again that God Almighty can never lie. And his promise is as sure as the heavens, despite the process. You ask me, what does it mean, Pastor? 
How could this be? How could we, how could we have a double casket funeral? I declare an enemy has done this. He's the same enemy who laughs when babies die and he rejoices when flowers fade. He celebrates our suffering and our grief. He is amused by our pain and he takes pleasure in our sorrow. He brings hell on us and blames God for it. He gets a kick from our misfortune and feels good when we do harm and wrong and mischief to each other. He orchestrates chaos, confusion and conflict and madness and he engineers dysfunction and destruction. I declare an enemy has done this. He is the father of lies and all deception is birthed from within him. He reaches the limit of his joy when we are denied, deprived, depressed and despaired. He keeps parties in hell when the doctor says it's cancer. Let it be declared and let it be heard that he does not have the last word and he will never have the last word because there is a plan for which he has no answer. And I know it to be true because God can never lie. So hang on. Despite the process, hang on despite the enemy and despite death and pain and sorrow and grief. Hang on, my Philbert sisters, for better days are coming. Hang on, children of God. Hang on to the promise because the God who made the promise of his visitation cannot lie. He shall surely visit you in redemption, in deliverance, and in salvation. In the painful process of life and its troubles, believe with me that God who has made the promise is able to stabilize you, to sustain you, to succor you, to surround you, to secure you, to nurture you, and keep you from losing your mind and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory in triumph and joy and exaltation. The process shows that as soon as we are born, we begin an inexorable march toward the grave. The process may be ugly, and unbearable sometimes but there is a promise to hold on to Amen. the promise may be tough the process may be tough but is there is a promise to trust the process may knock us down but it, there is a promise that keeps us grounded Amen. the process may create trouble on every side but because of the promise we don't give in to distress we may be perplexed because of the process but we don't give in to despair yes. we may feel alone sometimes because of the process but because of the promise we are never forsaken yes, we may be cast down in the process but we will never be destroyed yes. because there's a promise yes. and the god who made the promise can never lie yes. in jesus name then thirdly and finally, I'm moving quickly in verse 19c. We don't only see the promise and the process, but we see a plan. Yes, sir. There is a plan. Joseph says, children, God will surely visit you. That's the promise. He says, even after I die. That's the process. But then he says, carry my bones to the land of canaan carry my bones to the land of promise we don't only have a promise and a process but we have a plan there is a plan that says what will happen to joseph's bones it's a plan that gives the process meaning the promise will not be diminished not be denied because of the process and the process, as difficult as it may be, will not stop the plan. Joseph says, when God gets ready and he visits you with the exodus, don't leave me behind, even if I'm dead. When deliverance comes, don't leave me behind, even if I'm dead. Thousands of years later, the greatest theologian of all times, the Apostle Paul, will say that the Lord himself yes, yes. 
shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise and those of us who are in the graves little cemeteries will open up all over the place and we shall all be caught up in the air to meet Jesus in the clouds and so shall we ever be with him when deliverance comes those of us who serve God and are in relationship with him will not be left behind. Joseph says, don't leave my bones in Egypt. Egypt is the land of slavery. I want to declare to you again, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. Planet Earth is slavery. All the mess and the madness and the confusion. Slavery. And our bones, my brothers and sisters, even if we die, will not remain in the land of slavery. Yes, Dig up my bones and deliver me from this slave soil. Yeah. And Joseph got delivered and was part of the movement of God's people from the land of the curse to the land of blessing, even if he had been dead for over 300 years. In the midst of the hurt, the pain, the confusion, the grief, the sadness, and the sorrow, I declare, there is a plan. My family, the Philbert family, in the midst of the heartache and the heartbreak and the anxiety and the challenge and the difficulty of the process, which can be a nightmare sometimes, there is a plan. Hear me and hear me well. If you hold strain, if you hold on, if you realize that weeping may endure, but for a night, by the grace of God, I declare your joy will come in the morning. And this night of affliction of which you are part today can never be compared to the eternal riches of glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Almighty God has ordained the plan for a future exodus. A plan that will transform us from a place of sorrow to one of eternal success from one of earthly existence to the eternality of existence you ask me how do i know there is a plan i know because the bible tells me so for i read somewhere where daniel says that god's people shall be delivered every one of us for those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake to everlasting life i read somewhere where the prophet isaiah says the day is coming when almighty god shall make a request to every cemetery in the land he shall say to the south give up and to the north hold not back but bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the far ends of the earth i declare there was a plan that ensured that joseph's bones did not remain in slave soil of egypt even so, there is a bigger plan for our bones to not remain in the slave soil of planet Earth. Yes, we are going to lay Brother Henry Philbert and Stan Philbert to rest today, but we don't do so ignorantly. We don't do so out of our minds. We do so with intelligence because we know that the day is coming when the bones their being, their bodies will not remain in the slave soil of planet earth. I read somewhere where Jesus himself says, don't marvel at this saying, for the hour is coming when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth some to pain and hell, but those who love God to life everlasting. Stan's bones and brother Henry Philbert's bones, I declare, will not remain in the slave soil of some earthly cemetery. For Paul says, the Lord himself right. shall descend with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. And Paul continues by saying, we shall not all sleep or we shall not all remain asleep, uh -huh. but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. For this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. 
I heard the apostle John say, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Let them rest from their labor and their works will follow them. Amen. Joseph's bones did not remain in the slave soil of Egypt. After he had lived for God and had done God's will, he was symbolically resurrected from the land of slavery to enter the land of promise when the exodus took place along with three million of God's children, even his brothers and sisters. But I declare to you today that there is going to be another exodus one of these days, the real exodus. Theologians call it the eschatos. They call it the parousia. They call it the most powerful demonstration of God's amazing self-disclosure. When the voice of the eternal shall pierce the canopy of the heavens with the immortal words, it is done. And the heavens shall crack like glass and depart as a scroll. And behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him. Jesus shall descend victoriously to earth with battalions and battalions of holy angels in flaming chariots of dazzling glory that looks like fire to take his people home not just three million hebrews from egypt but all of god's children in view fort in grass in kako in tiroche in miku in deriso in dinri in in, in Castries, in Maranatha, in Grosile, in Bethany, Babano, in Chasse, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in Antarctica, in all over this place and all over the world, God shall call his children home. Amen. And our bones will not remain in slave sorrow. By the grace of God, we will be resurrected and be raised to a better life. And that will be glory for us. When we die, therefore, we die in hope. We die in expectancy. We die in promise. We die in prospect. We die in God. We die believing the promise that must come to pass. Because God Almighty cannot lie. We don't ignore the process. We know the process is there. But we know that God is with us through the process and we die knowing that we will we shall and we must rise again by the grace of God Stan cannot smile with us anymore but that's okay because he smiled for 55 years he cannot play anymore but that's okay because his music will live on brother Philbert senior with his quiet thoughtful reflections and pleasant smile cannot share with us anymore but that's okay because they fought a good fight yes, they finished the course and they kept the faith and surely their memories will never be forgotten one day as the christian faith teaches us death will fall helplessly exhausted at the doorstep of eternity and will be rendered incapable of doing harm and inflicting pain and generating grief. It will be the last enemy to be destroyed, says the Bible. And the people of God, the people of God in holy mockery, will turn death for all the pain, the grief, the enduring voids, the disconsolation, the disruption, and the misery that it inflicted on the human family. Oh, death! Oh, death! Where is thy sting? And no grave, where is thy victory? I declare to one and all the day is coming when no grave, no grave, I declare no grave shall hold our bodies down. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let us never confuse the promise with the process. Nor allow the promise to be undermined by the challenges of the process. Sometimes the process makes the promise look as if it's a far off. We get sick. We get diseased. We get depressed. And we die. We struggle to make sense of it all. And sometimes we are completely inundated by the creepy dark of doubt and uncertainty. 
But I declare to you based on the authority of God's word that because God cannot lie, the promise will hold. Because God has taken an oath on the basis of his own credibility, his character, his godliness, and he is categorically true to his promise. He will keep his word because it's not possible for my God to lie. There is a plan that is the antidote to the process of pain. The hurt and the pain do not have the last word. Almighty God has the last word. And if he says it, he wills it. And if he wills it, he shall surely bring it to pass. Rest in peace, my little brother Stan and my big brother Henry Filbert. Until your father calls for you. And when he does, you along with the rest of us will wake up clad in immortality because our bones shall never, I declare our bones shall never remain in slave soil. Yes, For I heard a voice of one from eternity past to eternity present, echoing all the way to eternity future saying, it shall be so, it shall be so, it shall be so. Hallelujah, yes, I declare, it shall be so. God bless you, and God will take care of you. Okay, the persons to sign will join Pastor Morayan at the table. And in the meantime, Brother Devon will bless us in song. Good afternoon, everyone. Keyboards. I have journeyed through the long dark night out on the I 
watching me. Now feel free to sing with me. It goes like this. The anchor. Let us all to stand as we do the prayer of comfort. Shall we stand, everyone? We are praying. Our Father, now God, we thank you for the promise, the process, and the plan. We are reminded of Paul's words in the book of Acts, that it is in you we live and move and have our being. You determine when we come into this world. You organize the process and you determine when we leave. We don't always understand, dear God. There are many times we question you, but we are confident on the authority of your word, and has, as has been declared through your manservant, that you never lie, that your promises are always certain. 
But in the meantime, while we wait, dear God, for the fulfillment of the plan, teach us to number our days. Teach us to monitor our lives so that we can apply ourselves unto wisdom. Especially do we present the grieving family before you. We ask, dear God, that in the moments when they feel lonely, when the crowd has dissipated, when the family has returned to their places of abode, we pray, Almighty God, that you would remind them that you are still there, that you will provide for us the strength that we need to move on. Until then, dear God, until we see you for ourselves, keep us faithful, keep us serving you, and ultimately, dear God, when you come to claim your loved ones, may every one of us who are here, along with our brother Stan and his dad, may all of us be found faithful to go home at last with you. We pray with thanksgiving. Let everybody say amen and amen. Please be seated. Yes, folks, we're going to cut the program short. So I just wanted to bear with us. I will take the place of my brother and extend an overall thank you to all of you in whatever way, whatever capacity you have extended help to us. Um, I will not take this time to go through all of the names. So just want to say a very, 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 very special thank you. And now we will have the closing prayer and the recessional. I invite you to stand with us as we have the benediction. O oh, kind and eternal God, ever since we pulled the curtains aside and commenced this program, we thank you for the intensity of your presence. In this moment, Lord, we therefore give gratitude and thanks to you you are certainly a God of hope in the midst of despair. We are thankful to thee, O Lord, that in the midst of life's struggles and battles, there is still the certainty of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so now, Lord, since you have given us the brilliance of the sunshine so that this funeral can be conducted, we give you thanks. And ever since, even, and also because you have gathered us together to celebrate the life of two legends, we thank you that in spite of the fact that their currents and the electricity of their lives are now removed, and the music of majestic fingers that played for us over the years are now made silent, we thank you that their bones will not be left in slaves soil and even as we have sung songs and hymns of comfort our hearts are trilled with the music of heaven and again we give thanks and even as we have listened to tributes that melted our souls and reminded us of times with the deceased we give you thanks for the hope of meeting again and even, Lord, as we have listened to a brilliant sermon from your servants, Elwin St. Rose, Lord, we march in faith. We have conquered sin, death, and the grave. And because you stand by to bless us, I take the liberty as your servant to pronounce a benediction upon your people. And now, Lord, I do so in your stead. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us all. Now and forevermore, we respond by saying, Amen. Okay, thank you very much, the Paul Bearers. We'll take the places. And our recessional song will be on the screen. Brother Stan will be playing first, and the rest of the platform party will. 
Okay, also to let you know that we have those of you who are from the town who need a bus to the cemetery, there is a bus. What's his name again, Charles? Manjak. Manjak. So Manjak will take you to the cemetery and back. All right. Oh, and before you leave the graveside, there'll be something very heavy that you could carry along with you. So don't forget to carry this one along. Okay, I'm told to tell you that there'll be refreshments at the gravesite. Make sure you collect on your way out at the gravesite. Yeah. 